Aware of the fact that the matter of aquatic herbicide treatment can be a sore subject among many fishermen, Kim scheduled a visit with a certified applicator, Dick Pinagle. Not only is Dick the owner of Aqua Weed Control, but he is also the current president of the Michigan Aquatic Managers Association. He begins by sharing the substance within a permit. 99.9% .9 of all water bodies are to have a chemical application require a permit uh, from the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, as an example, this is what one permit looks like. This is one permit and it's 10 pages long. But the permit uh, specifies what can be applied, when it can be applied, how often, treatment intervals. Uh, it specifies what the target plants can and can't be. Certain species have slightly different restrictions regarding how they can be treated and when. For example, emergent vegetation like lily pads. And we do as company policy permit all water bodies, regardless of the size. Typical treatment pattern for, for a lake, let's say, is a more of a widespread whole lake treatment, whole shoreline anyway, uh, typically the first part of the summer, late May and early June, before July 4th for sure. And then sometime in late July, early August, you might see us back uh, for spot applications, uh, milfoil regrowth for example, uh, some, some touch-ups around some docks and things like that. Uh, then we start getting more into the starry stonework control. Starry stonewort. This is the nasty invasive that most concerns me and is spreading rapidly throughout southern Michigan. As fishermen, we've come to appreciate that like native aquatic vegetation, most of the non-native weeds do have some beneficial value from a fisheries standpoint. For instance, Eurasian milfoil. Largemouth bass and other species absolutely love it. The foliage offers security where bass, minnows, and fingerlings can find refuge. And like in today's show, if you come across a healthy patch, I recommend you fish it. But as I mentioned before, the unfortunate problem is, if left unmanaged, these invasive weeds would rapidly spread way out of control. Starry stonewort, on the other hand, has more of a detrimental effect from both a fisheries and a recreational point of view. Dick tells us more. It's a macroalgae, so it's, it's an algae. It's not really an aquatic vascular plant. Uh, it's akin to Cara, uh, Nitella, and other macroalgae. But starry stonework can grow literally eight, nine, 10 feet tall. Uh, it can choke out all other aquatic plants. Nothing outcompetes starry stonework. In a variety of lakes, we've documented underwater how starry stonewort grows in tall billows, consuming much of the water column. At first glance, it appears as if you're looking at the lake bottom, when in reality, there's four feet of water column taken up by the starry stonewort below. You can visualize the depth by how I'm standing in the dense mat. In fact, these mats are so dense, much like a sponge, where fish can't really penetrate it for security. They just openly cruise over it as if it were the bottom substrate. The only area where they could possibly tuck away is right at the very lip of the edge. This is how starry stonewort appears on down imaging. It grows so dense that you get a bottom reading from the top of the mat at five feet. The true bottom on the screen is actually over eight feet. What's concerning is its density makes the starry stonewort extremely difficult to control. There's no one-shot control where you're gonna take out starry stonewort. It is, a, it is sort of taking it off layer by layer. Managing aquatic vegetation, especially in our eutrophic inland lakes, is inevitable. It needs to be performed to uphold any recreational value. Hey, I'm a lakefront homeowner, and my family likes to swim, water ski, and tube. But of course I realize too just how important aquatic vegetation is to maintaining a healthy fishery. It's basically an aquatic balancing act. The subject of balance, and, and it's, it's the right topic to have, it, it really is, because when you have folks paying yearly dues or they're getting assessed, many times they'll have an expectation and, and many times it can be a sort of a swimming pool expectation. And we as lake professionals and lake association folks 
we need to educate folks living on these water bodies that there must be a balance between a healthy aquatic plant community and a managed community to where you can still have a recreational value for what many of the folks expect. And we can have situations where we sort of, that's a headbutting problem. And I find myself, even though my business is controlling aquatic plants, but we want to do it uh, ethically and according to the permit where we must maintain a balance between recreational activities and a healthy plant community. How much structure should be in a lake? In the last study that, that I read, uh, produced by DNR Fisheries here in Michigan, was you need between 25 and 40 percent of the littoral zone must have healthy aquatic plants. So if you think about you've got, you know, 100 acres of littoral zone in your lake, you need to have about 30 acres of it or so with healthy aquatic plants at least. And that's something that should be considered.